Okay, we'll uh, kick off this uh, session. Um, so Andreas is going to talk about the uh, Dreambox, followed by some talks by Jan and Tobus. Um, I mentioned at the start of the mini-conf about the hands-on hardware demonstration. That has been set up on the table over there. Um, Michael's going to give a quick introduction to that at the very end of this session and then people can go across there and, and have a look at the hardware and, and um, have a play with it during the break and also after the mini-conf. Um, just another plug for the multimedia music related talks in the main conference. Um, two Wednesday, one on Thursday and one on Friday. Um, I'll run through those in more detail again a bit later. All right, on that note, Andreas. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Okay, perfect. So I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. <laughs> Um, I'm Andreas Frisch, I come from Germany, and I work with uh, Dreamboxes. What is this Dreambox? Uh, it's a, a set-up box satellite receiver. This is a main board of an older version. Um, quick uh, overview, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history. I'll keep this brief, just point out a few important, interesting milestones, and then um, I'll be speaking about uh, the different protocols, the standards that the streaming server can handle, and then about its architecture itself, and yeah, a few details on that. Good. So, brief abstract of where we're coming from. Um, it all started with uh, the German pay TV monopolist um, Premiere. Now it's Sky, actually. Uh, and they started uh, renting out a Nokia D-Box 2. That was a, uh, a satellite receiver box. It was running a uh, um, proprietary Linux uh, or Unix derivative by Beta Research. And its GUI was uh, entirely Java-based. So uh, a lot of people complained about it because it was running slow and it was missing features that were announced and never implemented. So a uh, few hackers started uh, cracking it open once it was available for retail sale in, um, uh, in, late, uh, in the late year 2000. And they got their hands on one and the, uh, the regular old, good old hardware hacking, they soldered probe wires to the memory chip and dumped its content and then uh, my colleague, uh, or former colleague, TMB uh, Felix, was able to uh, find a way how to, um, f uh, to interrupt the boot up process, and uh, that was infamous as the debug mode, and they were able to run homebrew code that way. So they got to um, use a Linux console on that, uh, on that box, and eventually, um, they'd use uh, tools that are uh, or that were programmed for the personal computer in uh, um, in a fashion of uh, controlling set-top box or, or not set-top box uh, DVD satellite receiver PCI cards that were around back then, like um, DVB Snoop. And uh, Felix wrote a little tool called EZAP that was then able to tune to channels, but it was all still very techy. You didn't have a, a way to use your remote control unit to actually go through the different channels. And um, that's how there were concurrent zapping guys, um, GUIs, uh, like Enigma was one of them, and then there were a couple others uh, that would let you um, do that and also look at the electronic program guide, things like that. So. Um, Eventually, they uh, uh, thought to themselves, why do we have to crack open a, a proprietary box? Um, it required a little hardware modification, a little soldering to be able to uh, run that debug mode. Why don't we just build a box ourselves that can actually uh, run Linux? 
so they created Dreambox, and um, that was the world's first set-top box shipped with Linux on board. It has um, a PowerPC SOC uh, system on a chip with uh, MPEG decoders, of course, what's necessary to uh, decode the DVB um, video, and was a Palace STB um, or O4500 uh, for specific for the set-top box market. And um, yeah, there were a few more models coming out, uh, ones that you rec could record to hard disk, of course, a personal video recorder approach. And then in 2005, uh, DreamRox first used Open Embedded, which is still around and really important in the embedded Linux field now. And um, we have our Open DreamBox distribution and it's a, it's a little Debian-ish like, uh, ha had IPKG packages in the beginning, now we use Debian packages. Then one very important milestone, that is when I joined the company, was the DM7025. That was the first uh, box to support um, pluggable tuners. The first boxes had them soldered on board and were only capable of handling uh, one of the uh, DVB systems. And the new ones um, also had uh, cards for satellite, cable, and terrestrial. And you could mix them however you felt like it. So it was very flexible. And um, this is when we switched over to MIPS architecture and first used GStreamer for MP3 playback. Streaming video wasn't really a thing back then. That was uh, before YouTube and all of those. But we used it also for MPEG program stream playback. And together with this box, uh, we released Enigma 2, um, the successor of Enigma without a version number. And um, that old version was fully written in C and very hard to um, get users to contribute because it was all really difficult and convoluted. And so we split the back end into a completely rewritten C++ uh, part and the entire GUI and plugin API, which is uh, very easily uh, usable in Python. And this. Uh, really led to our success in the uh, market because we had a rapidly growing community of contributors and enthusiasts who were using our um, box and our software and uh, enhancing it with uh, every thinkable <laughs> functionality. There are many uh, plugins that uh, we created um, like uh, YouTube playback, burning DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, a web interface that you can control your box with remotely, and uh, a lot of things that people have uh, coded. For example, uh, call monitors for your landline phone, or you can control domotic systems, ambience lighting, um, everything that you can think of, pretty much. Um, yeah, of course, all the boxes up to that point were standard definition boxes. So the receiver side is digital, digital video broadcasting, but the output is analog and standard definition. And then in 2008, we brought out the first high definition box, was the uh, DM800, and that was merely a, a byproduct of the uh, development of the 8000, which was really highly anticipated by all of our enthusiasts, especially by the uh, DX uh, community, um, the guys who are trying to uh, receive as many stations from as far away as possible, uh, connecting giant rotor dishes to their uh, receivers because it was so flexible. It now had two onboard tuners for satellite, uh, DVB-S2 now, HD version of uh, DVB-S, and uh, another two slots for uh, different uh, C or T or S tuners that you could use. Um, also, the HD boxes now use Broadcom. ATI, uh, of course, discontinued their Cilion series. And yeah, there were a few models. 
Um, GStreamer was able to uh, play a lot of uh, different uh, video formats with the new boxes because they had better codecs that handle a lot of uh, formats there like uh, DivX and uh, stuff that we didn't uh, play before. And we had to uh, have code to manually uh, plug, off, uh, plug all of those GStreamer elements uh, to, be, to be able to play that. Um, and that was really awkward giant switch case clauses. GStreamer has a really nice element called Playbin, uh, Playbin 2 back in the days uh, that takes care of all of that logic for you. Um, but we couldn't use it because our decode pipeline was non-standard. Um, typical decoding pipeline on a personal computer is that you have discrete GStreamer elements to take care of all the different tasks. Like you have a, a, a source element, um, a file source, for example, that reads from a file and then you demux that Matroska file, you get the separate elementary streams out of it. Um, you'll have to parse those in order to decode them correctly using a software decoder element. And then you need to queue them so that you can um, synchronize with the other, uh, with the audio stream, for example, then you may have to do a color space and stride transformation in order to display. And um, we uh, just have uh, the source, demux, and parser, like the typical pipeline, but then we use the um, still encoded video format, which is still H.264, and put that directly into our custom sync element. Same thing goes for audio. Uh, GStreamer is very well designed and in principle uh, should handle that. But when we started doing that uh, eight years ago or something like that, or 10 years, um, we were the only people actually uh, working with hardware decoders like that. And um, that's why there were a lot of issues that needed to be resolved first. And the GStreamer people really helped me a lot in that in the beginning. Um, now it's, uh, it's normal. Uh, we have uh, OMX, for example, and GStreamer is perfectly capable of handling hardware decoders, hardware elements. Yeah, then um, some intermediate feature list that we implemented. Uh, HBBTV is uh, a big thing in Europe. It's the successor of Teletext. Um, it's um, HTML-based, so of course we needed um, to implement a browser for that. We have a little cute browse browser. Um, DLNA, UP, UPnP, um, and media database is of course a thing that a lot of people like to use. HDMI CEC is uh, basically remote controlling of your television or your amplifier through the HDMI wire. Blu-ray burning I mentioned before. Um, I did a talk about that in Prague on a GStreamer conference in 2011 and um, I was the first people to approach uh, open source uh, BDMV writings, so uh, Blu-ray that are uh, spec compliant so that you can uh, play them in a standalone Blu-ray player. And yeah, we brought out uh, version two boxes that usually have like twice as much flash and RAM as the <laughs> previous ones. Uh, one uh, thing that I should probably mention is uh, that we were struggling with counterfeiting um, as a lot of uh, successful companies do. Our Enigma 2 system is uh, uh, open and uh, it's all started with um, images for the, uh, for the big uh, yeah, for, for the big other set-top boxes so that they could use Enigma on their systems. But it led to uh, our products being just counterfeited. And um, so we eventually uh, implemented a, a, a trusted platform module uh, authenticity check API for our uh, loyal custom uh, or for our loyal uh, plug-in developers that they can put in because the, uh, it's uh, a Creative Commons license that allows execution on our hardware. And that's what this is supposed to enforce. Mm. And the M7080 is um, our current top model 
I'm not going to read all of the technical data, don't worry. And yeah, the news since my last talk in, uh, uh, in, uh, da, 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 in Edinburgh, we're now using kernel 3.4, 3.5, and we've successfully switched over to system D. <laughs> it doesn't uh, trigger, automatically trigger any annoying, uh, <laughs> annoyedness by the audience anymore. Uh, GStreamer 1.0 port of our Enigma 2 backend is uh, finally done. It's not uh, released yet, it's still testing, but it, um, it should work really fine with the new uh, rewritten audio and video custom sync elements that we have. And uh, we are now doing subtitle support with GST overlay composition API. Um, Subtitles are a really important thing in a continent with dozens of languages, so people really like to use those a lot. And we used to, to uh, just fiddle the uh, um, text out of GStreamer and then render that on top of it in our Enigma 2, which is actually the display manager. But now we have GStreamer rendering it perfectly, nicely, prettily, and then um, this gets packed on top of the encoded video stream buffers and then taken out at the sync and then blitted by Enigma. And then there's a couple of improvements, of course, uh, uh, by the new uh, GStreamer version, for example, chapter support in Matroska containers, things like that. We use GStreamer for all um, video and uh, media playback that isn't television. So television, we uh, the DVB recordings we handle ourselves, everything else is GStreamer, everything else except for DVD. Um, an outlook is that we have a new product uh, in development, Goliath, and it's going to switch to a new hardware architecture and there's not much else that I can talk about at this point, but it's going to be there. Um, I've mentioned DVB. There are a couple other competing systems around the world, ATSC in Northern America, IDSDBT or IDSDB in uh, Japan, it's a Japanese system, and uh, Southern America mainly, then DTMB in China and Cuba, I think, uh, which probably has the most modern um, modulation scheme, it's supposed to be really nice. And then DVB-T in the rest of the, or DVB in the rest of the world, so Eurasia, Africa, and uh, apparently also Australia. Even though I haven't really heard of anyone using uh, Dreamboxes in Australia, except for a Michael guy who mailed me whether he should bring one or not for demonstration purpose but that was when I was already flying over, so I couldn't answer him in time. If he's here, I'd like to speak to him. Uh, picture of my cats, <laughs> Lily and Gray, because cats. <laughs> okay, second part. Um, history is over, now come um, the protocols that we support in, in our new little software. RTSP stands for Real-Time Streaming Protocol, and Sorry. It's a very old protocol. The RFC is from uh, 1998 from Columbia University. And um, RTSP doesn't uh, transfer any uh, video or audio data. It's just the requesting language, uh, kind of like HTTP headers. And uh, yeah, you, you get the server to describe what it can do. It will send you a, an SDP file, a session description protocol, which lists all the different media and all the different uh, elementary streams that it provides. There can be multiple different uh, camera angles or formats, bit rates, languages, and then the client decides which ones it wants to receive, and then um, RTSP takes care of finding the correct ports for every single elementary stream, and those are then transferred by RTP, a real-time transport protocol. RTP um, is necessary because it's, um, it's, a connect it's a stateless connection, it's UDP, so you need to be able to 
um, put the packets back into the correct order. So RTP has headers with uh, uh, timestamps and payload types so that you can uh, be sure that uh, you get the stream back together on the uh, client side in case of lost packages or um, wrong ordered packages. Um, yeah, then there's R RTCP, the real-time control protocol, which uh, generates uh, uh, sender reports and receiver reports so that you can uh, get an idea of the quality of service. Uh, today, nowadays, a lot of times, you'd use um, MPEG transport streams instead of the separate uh, elementary streams, which is probably... Uh, a nice thing because you have a transport stream somewhere upstream on your source, but you buy the simplicity with uh, network overhead and uh, loss of flexibility because MPEG TS already is a, um, a format um, designed for lossy connections. It already has timestamps in it and yeah, you can't independently, for example, switch the video bitrate and the audio language anymore because you already have a container that has it all in it, which is kind of sad. Then the next protocol is HLS. It's HTTP live streaming. It was introduced by Apple, and it always has H.264, always, I think, H.264 uh, video streams and AAC or MP3 or AC3, not, not as often audio elementary streams. It's just a transport stream that has been chopped into little segment files with uh, roughly the same length of a few seconds each. And then an index file uh, like a M3U um, audio playlist that lists all of the segments and then is continuously updated by the server um, to allow the clients which continuously download that file to find the correct next segments. Um, the payload is requested via HTTP and also transferred. So uh, you have the disadvantages of uh, TCP uh, over RTS, uh, RTSP or UDP, but you also have the advantages and that mainly is that you can use the World Wide Web CDN infrastructure for faster access for scalability and cacheability, the content um, distribution networks. A similar codex to HLS are MPEG Dash and Microsoft Smooth Streaming, uh, even though they use ISO for containers. Yeah. Okay, this is um, the architecture of our multi standard streaming server. Um, down below, you'll see a, a GStreamer pipeline graph as GStreamer can output it for debug purpose. Um, yeah, our multi-standard streaming server is called Dream RTSP server because in the beginning it wasn't that multi-standard, it was just RTSP, uh, I kept the name. And um, yeah, it, it allows us to stream live television or a particular channel, a particular DVB service from our um, SOC encoder device that's built into uh, the Dreambox. We wrote um, custom source elements for that that is able to read from the encoder device and put it in the GStreamer pipeline for further processing. You can stream that to local RTSP clients or local HLS clients or remote RTSP clients. Um, it's just a uh, standalone C application running as a systemd service. It uh, uses a glib2 main loop. Why glib? Because gstreamer uses glib, so it was the easiest doing it that way. We use uh, gstreamer version 1.62 and the independent um, GST RTSP server library, which uses gstreamer to create an RTSP server. And we use libsoup for um, serving the HLS segment files. Libsoup is also a glib project, made it really easy to put it all together. And it uh, communicates with uh, the main application Enigma 2 using Dbus. Um, 
Yeah, on the left side we see the audio and video source elements, uh, which uh, can output uh, H.264, respectively audio MPEG elementary streams. Um, on the video part, you can specify the dimensions, and uh, so it goes up to 1080p. And uh, also the uh, bitrate, of course, and for the audio, also the bitrate in kilobits per second. And da -da -dum. yeah, those uh, uh, elementary streams uh, need to be framed into, uh, um, into the GStreamer buffer layout using uh, the respective parser elements and um, then queued up because uh, after uh, we, we, we need to duplicate all of those because we want to use them in more than one branch down below the pipeline and after uh, every T element we need Q elements so that if one branch goes at a different pace than the other one uh, they don't block each other. And then one of the sets of elementary streams we uh, sync into the uh, local GST RTSP server. So this uh, Cyan box up on top is an independently running GStreamer pipeline with a couple dozen elements in it again, just a small representation of it. And how much time do I have left? Yeah, uh, I should probably make this a little bit quicker then. I can go into it if anyone's interested. The second, so the uh, GST RTSP server then streams to client that connect to it um, using RTP streams. Um, the second set of uh, elementary streams coming from, from the source elements uh, are put into a MPEG TS max element which uh, turns it into an MPEG TS stream and then that MPEG TS stream goes into a T again because we need it in three different branches. Yeah, I'm going to skip that real quick. Into that uh, T element, queues again after the T element and then we uh, uh, sync that again into a GST RTSP server because our local RTSP server provides both the separate elementary streams and also a transport stream. Um, my experience uh, or experiments showed that uh, handheld Android devices can handle a TS better than the separate elementary streams. So we're also providing that locally. And then the top branch is, um, I'm not sure if you can read that, probably not. It's an HLS sync element, GStreamer HLS sync, which takes care of splitting the transport stream into separate files and also writes, continuously writes the index file and then just puts those on, um, yeah, on a tempfs from where I can serve it using the libsoup um, HTTP server and um, multiple multiple clients, namely iPhones, Apple things, they like the HLS. Um, yeah, and then the bottom branch is for our remote RTSP um, server. We use a network TCP client sync to connect to a remote instance of a, we call it Dream Mediator, it's running in our data center and this stream mediator has an internal uh, GST RTSP server again from where the clients can get the streams through the internet. Um, why not just uh, share the local RTSP server and HLS server to the world? Yeah, we, you can do that if, <laughs> yeah, if you have good nerves, but um, we don't want our customers to have to expose their uh, LAN devices to, uh, to the internet in order to be able to stream to, uh, if they wanna watch their local television in their holiday location or on their phone when they're in the city or something like that. So we do it that way because this doesn't require any firewall forwarding or anything like that. We just initiated a, uh, the TCP uh, a stream from our client behind the firewall to our uh, data center and then that's easy. 
Um, yeah, here's a little more uh, pros about uh, how it internally works and plays together. Until when do I have? 15 minutes. Good. So on the left, there's our um, set-top box. It runs Enigma 2 as its main application and Dream RTSP server as the RTSP server, of course. In our data center, we're running a stream master, um, which uh, the Enigma um, can request a uh, key and ID from when the um, uh, streaming plugin is first loaded, first activated. And then when a user decides to share their uh, live television stream or their or, or a particular service that they can specify so that they can watch something else than what they're streaming, uh, it requests a uh, stream token from the stream master and gets a UUID4 token back and also the destination port and host um, that it's supposed to stream that to. Um, yeah. We, we could use uh, load balancing at this point so that uh, we just go through and give it new uh, server addresses in case the one server is on overload. Then um, Enigma goes through Dbus and tells uh, the Dream RTSP server to start streaming there. Then it'll open that uh, or put that uh, TCP client sync into its pipeline request a pad at the T element so that the new branch is added. And then it'll uh, yeah, open a, a socket and upload the token to uh, the, dream, uh, to the um, data center. And that spawns an instance of a dream mediator just by using xinetd. And then dream mediator verifies that token. Is it does it look like a key? If it does, it, does it have the right length and the right format? If it does, then it uh, um, checks with Stream Master, is it uh, valid? Can, can I start accepting that? And then it'll block the, uh, uh, it'll block the, the transfer so that the uh, Dream RTSP server, the sender box knows, okay, everything is fine. If not, it'll just disconnect and then the box knows, no, I'm not supposed to stream there. And then when a user, uh, a uh, device starts uh, um, or wants to view that stream, they go to a little web interface. We have a, a, a web interface, um, yeah, a testing one right now that it can get the, um, the stream URI, which is a long hash from, uh, by putting in the correct box key and box ID. And then as soon as it starts downloading um, or as soon as it requests, it does the RTSP request, then the Dream Mediator instance will start reading from the socket again. Um, on the Dream RTSP server side, the queue in front of the TCP sync element runs under, and then the transfer starts again. That's how it notices, okay, we need to supply data now. Yeah, and then this gets forwarded internally in the Dream Mediator to the clients. Um, and I should probably mention that we've had a local HTTP streaming on the Dreambox for 10 years or something. And this works differently. It doesn't work through the encoders. It directly reads the data from um, the DMUX uh, device and just sends it out through HTTP. Pardon? The what? No, that's, it's already filtered. It's, a, it's an MPEG-TS already, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's just not as flexible. You can't uh, change the bit rates of it if you ha want to stream this uh, remotely, anything like that. So you're going, going to need a 16 megabit for, uh, for a channel. Um, yeah, short model overview. And um, I could probably try, I could probably give it a try, can I, if I can find the mouse cursor, yeah, VLC, does this work, 
Oh, it works on the other screen. So, where is it? Sebastian, how do I get over? No, it's on the, on the other screen. We believe in. Ah, well. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, that was probably a little bold of me. <laughs> so we have this web interface that uh, lets you uh, select the, the different channels and you can go through and put in your recordings, times like that. And I can show you later if anyone's interested. So, questions? There are a couple. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, you didn't mention HTTP, so does it mean that uh, the set of boxes do not support HTTP? That's right. Okay. By not support uh, HTTP, it means the output that we generate is not encrypted. Yeah. So you mentioned H, uh, HBB TV. Yeah. Um, how have you got on supporting like the tweaks and enhancements different broadcasters are doing around the world? And is your stack open source and available for reuse? I'm not sure about that because I didn't write the HPV TV implementation. I would have to check with my colleague. Um, now one reason for bringing this up is uh, I know Australia and New Zealand are both uh, rolling out what they call hybrid TV at uh -huh. the moment. Yeah. based on HBB TV, and there's a real lack of open source implementations. There is a browser-based plugin mm -hmm. using Firefox, but like integrating it with DVB-T or DVB-S tuners is like really quite painful, so it'd be good if there was an implementation of the projects like XBMC or Myth TV could reuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we're definitely always looking into things like that. We uh, are always in contact with our customers directly. So uh, if a customer has a problem with a uh, Uzbekistan uh, channel not rendering correctly or something, they directly speak to us engineers and we fix that issue. Uh, and we're happy to look into that. Can you be more specific on the Broadcom drivers you're using, whether, which version, uh, whether no, this is, okay. I can, I'm sorry. This okay. is the only part of our whole thing that is uh, con uh, NDA, um, yeah, it's, uh, we can't disclose it. How do you debug a stream in Uzbekistan? <laughs> Uh, that was just a, a bad example, <laughs> but uh, like there's all um, there's many standards uh, and uh, the providers, the different TV providers seem uh, to be interpreting them very, uh, yeah, <laughs> independently. So we constantly have to go through and fix up encodings and things like that for specific stations, and we always do that. Any more questions? So if you could uh, join me and thank Andreas for his uh, talk. Thank you very much for your attention.